I have four clarifications for Finance Minister. <clears throat> um, but before that, uh, I'd like to thank him for touching briefly on the longitudinal studies. I'll be taking this matter up further with MOE at the COS. Um, <clears throat> now, the Finance Minister, uh, first clarification, he referred to uh, Mr Lau's uh, speech yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, Mr Lau is rushing to Parliament right now after attending to some uh, family matters. Uh, and he <clears throat> mentioned that... Um, uh, you know, somehow the Workers' Party was not uh, being upfront because uh, we, we didn't want the government to distract um, this debate by announcing the GST. Now, if I heard him correctly, <clears throat> actually his speech was focused on supporting uh, the government's accurate identification of the challenges going forward with uh, becoming a global Asian node and so on. And he did actually specifically say that it's fine for the government to announce the GST uh, 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 hike or intended hike in advance of time, and we can actually have a separate debate about it. Um, and his main point was that by doing it in this budget, it distracts the debate from the other things that are being done in the budget because everybody's focusing on this thing, which isn't even a budget measure. So, so that, that is the first thing. And uh, of course, you know, there was a, a bit of a cut and trust about whether we should debate it at the election rally. And we do welcome the, the early announcement because we think the voters should, should also make a decision on this. Um, second clarification <clears throat> is about the uh, party position on the announcement of the GST, and I think Pitam Singh may, may uh, also elaborate on this further, uh, about why it was said by him that we cannot support the announcement at this point in time. Now, um, the government itself uh, is not definitive about when this is going to happen. It may be seven years from today, and uh, of course, we do note that in the run-up to the budget discussion, there were some test balloons being floated out about the fact that the government needs to raise revenue. And immediately, the public seized on the fact that DPM Taman and perhaps other leaders had earlier said that the government has enough money uh, for the decade. So the public pointed out that, hey, you know, is this a contradiction? And I, and I rather suspect myself that the government is stuck with that announcement. Otherwise, you know, if that announcement had not been made, perhaps we would be debating a GST hike today. So, you know, um, earlier on, uh, Minister Heng also says that, well, the government has not made a decision on when because it has itself to look at prevailing conditions, economic conditions, and also our needs at the time. Fair enough. Similarly, I don't think uh, we will be in a position to take a stand on that until the information is available at the relevant point in time. So I think it's ridiculous for the government to expect us as a responsible party to support something where all the information is still not available and we don't have a crystal ball. And related to that, I, I should clarify, in case anybody uh, misunderstands, that uh, it is our intention to support the budget when the vote is called, but this should not be mistaken as a support for this announcement of some possible GST hike in a later budget. should not be mistaken as such. Um, Third clarification, I think um, Minister touched on uh, why it is not prudent to use land sales as part of government revenue. I mean, this is an issue that we have de debated before. But he, the analogy he gave was, um, you know, we have five parcels of land and if every few years we sell one parcel, there will be none left. But I think Minister can clarify that it's not quite like that. And, and land sales actually include many leases which do come back to the government after the tenure of the lease. It's not a case of it being gone forever or even 10 years for the commercial leases. Uh, and finally, my, perhaps my last clarification is, um, I mean, Minister pointed out um, about the social mobility in so far as uh, educational attainment of 15 year olds in the performance of science in the PISA uh, report, uh, to say that our poorer students are doing better than their poorer counterparts in the OECD countries. I filed a PQ on this before. But I think the report also highlights that uh, as far as equity is concerned, our poorer students seem to be further behind our richer students. The gap internally, domestically, compared to the OECD countries. So, I mean, isn't it not really comforting for our poorer students to tell them that they're doing better than their poorer counterparts in other countries when really in their class, they're actually further behind than on average? Minister. Well, I, th I thank the member, Mr. William, for your question. <clears throat> first, on your first point about, um, you know, 
my reference to Mr. Lao Tiakyang's point. Uh, I think I have something. Actually, when, when I was listening to him yesterday, I thought I was very happy that you know, he supported the point that I made about making Singapore a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. And that uh, he went on to talk about the various moves that the government made over the years to look ahead and position Singapore to be able to take a, uh, to be able to meet new challenges and secure new opportunities because the world is changing very quickly. So he he made a very good speech on our engagement, particularly with China, and I was very surprised that towards the end of that very good speech, he then got distracted by this statement. And let, let me see what I have. He says, sir, the unfortunate thing about this budget is that it is forward-looking too hastily for future revenue stream by prematurely, prematurely announcing a GST height. It has become an unnecessary distraction from the vision articulated in this budget. And as, as a real distraction, causing the government to lose its focus on getting buy-in for the vision. Now, this is a, a real distraction. Because in fact, if the Workers' Party truly believes that all the things that you and your members have advocated, spend more on this, spend more on this group, spend more on this, others, and that you agree that all this will require new revenue measures, then why don't you just say that, yes, we are very happy to support this, so let's now talk about how we are going to position Singapore for the future. I'll be very happy to, do, to discuss this with you. You can file a motion, a separate motion to discuss it. But bear in mind that this is the budget debate. And if we do not talk about a tax increase, we do not debate the tax increase in this very forum, in this very session for the budget debate, then where else are you going to do it? And to suggest that you do it at election rally is, is just a complete distraction. <laughs> right? Do you want to be constructive and say that in any election, we talk about serious things, about how we are going to tech Singapore, how we're going to position Singapore for the future, how we're going to create a better life for all Singaporeans, rather than to seize on issues that will make people unhappy and say, oh dear, you know, the government is going to tax you and all that. And therefore, you know, this is a bad move. You must square your position. Do you accept, first and foremost, all that we said, that we do need to spend more? Right? Whether it is preschool, whether it's skills future, whether it is healthcare, whether it is uh, revamping the economy, whether it is security. Do we need to provide for that? And if it is, as I said very clearly in today's uh, uh, debate, in my roundup, I said that even the two percentage point increase in GST does not fully cover the expected increase in healthcare expenditure. Is it not right for us to say that we know that there is one item that is going to definitely go up, and we will not even have enough to manage that one item, that we take one measure first and look at how we can meet that. <clears throat> so your, Mr. Pritam Singh's uh, argument about, I can't support this at this point, because you know, it's so far away, I don't know uh, your revenue pattern, I don't know your spending pattern, and therefore, you know, I don't know what you can do, therefore I'm not going to support it. I don't think it's, it is a rigorous or honest position. <clears throat> it cannot be, right? If you know, <clears throat> as an individual, that you don't have enough money to even pay for your basic meals, should you not provide for some of that? Never mind that I don't know what other things we have to spend on. I mean, that, that is very simple to understand, and I really don't understand why you want to create this already, I must know everything before I can decide on anything. 
I think if I had taken that approach, if previous finance ministers have taken that approach, you know, that I must know every item of expenditure before I can support you, before I know how much to, to raise, we would have been in serious deficit long, long ago. So I'm very grateful that, you know, previous finance ministers and, and governments and prime ministers have been extremely prudent in making sure that when we know something is coming, don't avoid it. Don't pretend that it is not coming and then mislead our people and say that, I, therefore, without knowing, I cannot support. So the question for, for me is very simple. Do you support those increased spending? Or are you contradicting all your MPs' position yesterday where everyone spoke about doing more? And if you do, then tell me, how much is it going to cost? And even to fund a fraction of what you have suggested, where is the money going to come from? And would a 2% stage point increase help us in some ways? Do you disagree with the fact that our healthcare expenditure will go up? And if you, if you don't disagree, then the question is, how do we find the revenue sources to meet that? So that's your answer to your first question. <clears throat> and also your second question about <clears throat> why your party's position, but why you cannot support at this point. Yeah. So now that I know that it's your party's position, I'm even more puzzled because I wonder why all your MPs, every single one of them, spoke about, let's do more. In fact, none of them has suggested that, no, 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 you should cut back on this item or that item. In fact, very good. Whatever you do, double up, do more. So the question is, if I accept all your proposals, I have to redo the expenditure sums again and look at what else we need to do. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, so I think that is uh, quite a distraction. <laughs> I hope that Mr. Lau was not distracted somewhere. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as to your point about the land sales, you know, why my five parcel analogy is not a, the correct one, the, the basic fact is this. Most of our land sales are of pretty long leases. 99 years for industrial land, some 30, some 60. Now, if you sell that land, for 99 years, you're not going to get back that land until 99 years, until 100 years later. So if you're rigorous about it, you really ought to be spending no more than 1% of that land sale proceeds, even if you want to use land sale proceeds, because that's what the land is worth for a year. But for Mr. Pritam Singh to say, oh, don't worry, let's take 20% of the land sales uh, and therefore use that, isn't it the equivalent? And you are not going to get the land back for the length of the lease. So that stream, that upfront capital payment, ought to be considered over its lifespan. And therefore, it is not proper. In fact, uh, several MPs have spoken earlier yesterday that even for building infrastructure, we should be considering life cycle costs. So I think we better do our financing properly. Then on your point about science and the PISA score and the students, now, we're not saying that we have a perfect education system. In fact, there are many things which I'm very happy that Minister Ng Chi Ming and Mr Ong Yi Kang are continuing to do, building on the works of previous finance minister, to continue to raise the... Sorry? Education, education minister, sorry. <laughs> Did I say finance? Oh, OK. <laughs> Same person. I, I'm not hinting at any uh, changes. <laughs> I got distracted, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they continue to build on this good work that all these changes have taken place for many, many years. And the fact that our students are doing so well, it is really a tribute to our educators, to our parents, to the many self-help groups. So the numbers which I've shown are done by the OECD study, not just of PISA, but in fact of various areas in which they are looking at our kids, including in areas like collaborative problem solving. I mean, our kids are ranked best in the world in this. So I think we must give credit for this. And 
as former education minister, I can tell you that the reason why collectively we are ranked so high, the very important reason is this. In every country, you can find one good school, one of the best schools for which the elites will go to. In Singapore, if you look at the performance of students across our schools, you can see what a high average it is. Yeah. Yeah, so when I say every school a good school, it, it, is not, it, it is not just a few good things because I really think that we must give credit to all our educators, to all our principals and to all our parents for the hard work that they put in so that regardless of which school you go to, the child has the best chance of success. And beyond the basic foundation, as, we move into, as they move into post-secondary education, that we have many more pathways, many more pathways for them to excel. So I think it is right and proper that we look at what has been achieved <laughs> rather than look at what has not been achieved and therefore you know, pick on that one narrow area and discredit the work that has been going on by so many good people.